I'm Rob. And I'm Nate. And welcome back to Rob and Nate Record a Podcast. This is week four of our war movie theme month, wrapping up the theme month. And it was my second selection. And I intentionally went for something very different than what we'd been watching. Yeah, I thought it was weird that you picked the 1978 film Going Coconuts starring the Osmonds. Because that has nothing to do with war, unless there's some kind of subtle messaging that I'm missing. Could you explain that choice? You missed the subtle messaging. Okay, I thought so. No, I, so as you've caught on, I, I think we said it in the first episode, we decided that each film was going to be from a different war. Mm-hmm. And we each were picking two different movies. We did coordinate ahead of time which wars which we war. were going to cover, so we didn't end up with two of the same war. To an extent, but all I knew about this one was it would be a war after Vietnam. You didn't even tell me what war it was. Yes. And so I decided I was going to jump. Like, I thought about doing something like Black Hawk Down, but you recently watched that. I thought about doing something like um, The Hurt Locker, but we Hotel both have all seen that. Mm-hmm. We talked about Hotel Rwanda, and I still have some mixed feelings. Maybe I should have gone with Hotel Rwanda, but that's tangentially war. I mean, it's war, but it's... It's a war. It's just yeah. not a war the U.S. fought. And so I decided rather than doing that, I was going to jump all the way forward to... Afghanistan or Iraq. Mm. And again, I, th- I thought about something like the Hurt Locker. Ultimately, I decided to... The, uh, I wanted to do something more that neither one of us... Well, that you ha- especially had not seen. You also wanted to brick format somewhat. And yes. A really different type of... Film. And so there was not a lot of like dramatic war movies from these more current conflicts that we already hadn't seen or that were well regarded. And so I decided to break form and actually go with a documentary. Mm -hmm. And my plan coming into today was actually to watch Restrepo. But I was mistaken in my understanding about these movies. I thought that Restrepo and Korngal both had been made for Netflix and were Netflix properties. And it turns out that is not the case. And for some reason, Restrepo was from 2010, and it actually was nominated for an Oscar for Best Documentary and was well-regarded. For some reason, you can't find that streaming anywhere. Mm-hmm. And so I thought it was going to be, I had assumed it was going to be available to stream on Netflix, and it turns out that it's not. And so we ended up watching Korengal because I could rent that on Amazon Prime. Okay. Restrepo is about a forward operating base in Afghanistan in the Korengal Valley. The forward operating base is named after a private who was killed at that outpost, na- whose name was Cor- uh, Restrepo, Juan Restrepo. And you had seen this. I've seen Restrepo previously. But you had not seen what we watched today. No. All right. Um, I'd seen Restrepo previously, and it's about the creation of this forward operating base and setting it up. And this was kind of during that coin period in the the strategy in Afghanistan, you know, the hearts and minds stuff. So this is somewhere 2007 to 2009-ish? I believe it was filmed in 2009 and released in 2010. Okay. I'm not positive about that. I didn't double check. And so I was going to show you Restrepo because it's them setting up this outpost. And I mean, there's some of it that's shown a little bit in Korngal, but they showed up and they were digging foxholes and they were trying to fill sandbags. And then they eventually got these things called ASCOs, which are like basically like large reinforced sandbags that you just fill up with rock and dirt and material. And it because it's so thick and heavy, it can stop bullets and, and projectiles and things of that nature. And they actually eventually build an outpost there. And this unit was there for a year. Is it the same unit that we see in this? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then Korengal is a revisiting of, of this outpost. The same unit with the same commanders is sent back to Outpost Restrepo for another year. Wow. And that's what we see in this movie, Korengal. And so the plot summary from IMDb of, of Korengal is Korengal picks up where Restrepo left off with the same men, the same mali- valley, the same commanders, but a very different look at the experience of war. Mm -hmm. Like I said, Restrepo focuses on that setting up of the outpost, that building up the start of that, you know, the connecting with the the villagers there in the valley and trying to build relationships with them and then eventually handing that off to another unit. Mm -hmm. Korengal comes back and it's established and now outpost Restrepo is viewed not as a way to connect with the people and go out and hunt the Taliban. Rather, it's a spot that's viewed as we're leaving it here because they're coming to us. So instead of us having to go find the enemy to kill them, they're coming to us and we just have to kill them. 
and it's a it's a real look at the experience of war in Afghanistan, but a very different tonally and all that type mm-hmm. of stuff. And there's a lot of interviews with the soldiers and things of that nature. Nate, this was your first exposure to either of these. Have you seen anything like this about Afghanistan? And then what are your first reactions? I have not. I had heard of uh, Restapo before, and I think I might have had a vague knowledge that there were uh, follow-up productions. So I came in not knowing what this was until a minute or two before we started watching it, which is was kind of my preference. So I was not expecting a documentary. I kind of expected you were going to show me something like Hotel Rwanda, something about a war that happened after Vietnam that the United States was not involved in. So at first, I was a little less than enthusiastic about it, but it really grew on me. Like the longer you spent with these soldiers and the more you got to know them, At first, I'm thinking, like, I don't really need this. This could be, like, a short. But there actually is a value to spending that much time and getting more invested in them and getting to know them, and both through the conflict and through the boredom and through the the friendships that they strike up. I thought it was really good, actually. I, I, I don't think I've seen anything quite like this before, but it definitely follows the spirit of, say, like a World War II platoon movie or something like that where you have the little group of characters and they have their various eccentricities and you get to know them over time and how they interact with each other that was it was interesting it was a perceptive little little snippet of the war or this little kind of out of the way valley well, and this conflict is a little bit different in that we've gotten to a point where now we're embedding documentary filmmakers with units in combat. Well, that, that was done to an extent. But not to the same as extent as it was done this time. Mm. And now we're also at a point where, you know, part of the footage that's shown in this film is not stuff filmed by the documentary film crew. It was stuff filmed by the Taliban. Yeah, Viewing the that. soldiers, you know. There's and a couple times where they have the, the, the grainier Taliban footage, and they'll say Taliban footage in the bottom, and I'm like... Are the closing credits going to say a special thanks to the Taliban? (laughs) Yeah. So, and the director on this, I failed to mention earlier, is Sebastian uh, Junger, who I'm just pulling up some of his filmography real quick. He's best known for Restrepo, the the previous documentary we were mentioning, the movie The Perfect Storm from 2000, and then this documentary from Korangal. Did he direct uh, Perfect Storm? Must have done something else on it. Maybe cinematography. He was a writer for The Perfect Storm. Okay. His directorial credits, he gets directorial credit for a total of seven things. Restrepo, that documentary, another documentary, all of them are documentaries. There was Which is the Front Line from Here? The Life and Time of Tim Hetherington. Korangal, The Last Patrol. Hell on Earth, The Fall of Syria and the Rise of ISIS. Going to War. And then his most recent in 2020 was called Blood on the Wall. Yeah, so some of the people that we see in this film, there's L- Lamonta Caldwell, who, if I remember correctly, was the the sergeant. There's Miguel Cortez, Stephen Gillespie, Aaron Heer, Sterling Jones, and Dan Kearney. Those are the most the ones we see the most in this. But you have interviews not just with the soldiers in the unit. You have some interviews with some of their commanders. And it's interesting, and, and, and I really do kind of wish that you had the background of Restrepo, okay. because as they first are making contact with these villagers, you know, they bring in supplies, they bring in food, they bring in school supplies, you know, they're able to start setting up schools in this village and this type of stuff. And then here in this one, you have a village meeting where they brought in the regional governor, and they're meeting with the, the people of this village, the elders of the village, and the villagers are talking about how you know, if you when you guys leave, yeah. we don't have schools anymore. We don't have these things, mm-hmm. you know. And it's obvious that they care less about that than just being able to live. Well, yeah, I mean, they're from an understandable, understandably pragmatic perspective. You know, what they said has come to pass. Yeah. You know? So the Americans are gone. These these things you brought us will go with you. You know, but the soldiers talk, or the commander, I forget the guy's rank, but this commander that they're talking to, the leader of the unit, he talks about how he doesn't trust many of these elders in, in the village because he's watched them, you know, like they give them supplies and then they watch them walk out of view and then come back and immediately they're taking fire from that position. 
you know, and he's, but he talks about how even though he doesn't trust a lot of these people, he respects them. Talks particularly about the uh, the chief elder. Yep. About how this is a man that, what did he say? He comes to his door when there's a knock on it, and it could be us, it could be the Taliban, and he comes unarmed. Yeah. Because he has, you know, he playing both sides. That's the prudent thing for him to do. Yeah. Or a logical thing for him to do. Yeah. Yeah, and it, and it's interesting, and, and you get. In this movie, you know, it kind of really gives a little bit of a, a taste of the perspective of some of these soldiers to the extent that anyone could who has, hadn't lived in the Korangal Valley for 12 to 15 months. But you have this, in particular, this one private, Miguel Cortez, who talks about how at one point he just quit caring. He didn't take cover when they were getting shot at because he didn't care if he died. And the only reason eventually that he started taking cover again is because his unit leaders came to him and said, look, it's not about whether what happens to you. It's that if you get hit now, somebody else has to come and get you, mm-hmm. you know, and things of that nature. And just war is, is rough. It's bad. It's, you know, it's, it's a hard mm-hmm. thing, but this is also our generation's war. You know, there was, yeah, to the extent that either of us would have ever ended up in the army. If we had it, this is what mm-hmm. we would have been seeing. Mm-hmm. So, and uh, yeah, it's interesting to see. And they're so young. I mean, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one. Most of them. And the music they listen to. There's a scene where they're playing Guitar Hero. Uh, I like the scenes where they're showing them kind of just in their off time, horsing around, and kind of getting a sense of them. And that you know other aspect of war, which is the boredom and the monotony, because it's that. And then there's the firefight. And they talk about how you know, I could be reading a book or I could be in a firefight, and I would prefer to be in a firefight. And about the adrenaline that comes with that, and now it's obviously if somebody dies, that's a tragedy and it's not fun. But coming back from a firefight when everybody's fine, and the feeling of cheating death, just what a high that is, and how they kind of miss it. You're going from that to the back to the monotony, monotony of the the outpost. Yeah, well, let down. They talk about this outpost in a 365 day span. It was in combat, like actually, like shooting and all that type of stuff something like 230 or 240 days out of the 365 days. Oh. It was nine of the 12 months, effectively, they were under, you know, engaged in combat. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, they would go periods of, of maybe a few days without having firefights, but then they also talked about how there was days that they'd have you know, eight to ten firefights in a day, mm. which is not the normal experience you know, in some of the areas of Afghanistan, but... For this area, that was the norm. And they also talk about how this area is not what people imagine when they imagine Afghanistan. They kind of think of desert and rocks. But this is more like Colorado or ports of Oregon, or Idaho. It's, it's mountainous. It's high up. That village is interesting. They were doing a scan shot, and you saw this one structure that looked like it could have been hundreds of years old. And right up above it is an older, stru- uh, is a newer structure that has a kind of gating that you might have seen on a house in the 1960s in the United States. And they're all just kind of hanging on to the side of, of this this valley wall, yeah. you know, this mountainside. Well, and in the wintertime, the soldiers are talking about how this outpost could be turned into like a a lodge for a ski resort. Yeah. You know, and they joke about it being a resort. Yeah. Yeah. So it's an interesting area. A, a lot of them respect the terrain, like the actual beauty of the place, but it was a very violent place in, in this conflict. And it's kind of weird to think about how some of the violence and experience that was experienced by these guys in this remote outpost, you know, in this valley was then eventually brought to the city as, as we had the withdrawal. Yeah. Interesting stuff. I don't feel like we're going to be talking about this super long. It's kind of hard to talk extensively about a documentary. Mm. But yeah, what other thoughts do you have on this um, movie? Again, it was it was an interesting perspective. I like staying with the group for as long as they st- stayed with the group. It'd probably be worth seeing a Restepo for me at some point. It was about the war, but it was more about the interrelationships of these guys and then how this experience happens. And as it gets to the end, they're talking about, it's like, you know, I'm going to have a bond to these people that I won't even have with my family, because unless you're here, you know, you don't know what that's like. And these are my brothers for life now because we've been through this together. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm I'm not a veteran. I I would be ill suited to uh, combat. And in some ways, I don't find it particularly interesting. Poss- possibly because well, because I, I there's not really a 
something that I can hook on to. It's so foreign to me. But but I, I respect the hell out of him for, for doing that. And, you know, something I, I could never do. And, you know, it's... I'm glad there's people that are willing to do it. Obviously, this is a war that has a very mixed legacy because we're essentially back to where we started. So that adds a certain level of uh, tragedy and an emphasis on the fertility of yeah. the whole thing. I have a question for you before we get into ratings. Before we started this, I told you I was a little bit nervous about today mm-hmm. because I was making such a tonal shift yeah. in my pick for today. And I said that either I felt like either you were going to like the film or you were going to think it was just meh. So how did I do? You actually did pretty good. Okay. When this first started, I'm like, oh, if I want to see this. This <laughs> guy is just talking head. It's like, I, I can't relate to these people. It's like, I'm not really interested in this day to day. But again, as, as I said before, I'm glad it wasn't just a short because it, you had to be kind of immersed with them. It's not a long movie. It's only about 88 minutes. Yeah. But you had to be immersed with them to really, for, for something to click about this experience that they had together and, and about the war. Yeah. Well, and, and neither of these movies is particularly long. If I believe Restrepo is 93 minutes and the, the listed runtime for this was 84 minutes. So okay. I guess wrapping up, how, what, how would you rate this movie? I would give it three. I thought at the beginning I would give it two or two and a half, but again, it grew on me. And on the 10 star scale, I'd probably give it a seven. We're pretty well aligned on this. I'd also give this a three and a seven. Part of the reason I was planning to go with Restrepo is because between the two, it has the higher rating on IMDb. So on IMDb, Restrepo has a 7.4 star rating, and this has a 6.7 star rating. Does it have more action? Because there's, there's, I mean, you see firefights from a distance, and it, it'd be hard to show. Restrepo does have a little bit more action yeah. in it, because especially at the beginning, because it's, I mean, it's starting from sandbags to yeah. to the Ascos, you know, and everything has to be brought into him by helicopter, and yeah. I'll bet that's interesting to see how they... Because I, I was wondering, how do you get these materials up on this hillside? Well, and you saw part of that in this documentary. That they only really showed one resupply in this. The generator. Yeah. Um, well, but even then, they're showing... You're getting an idea because... And they show it better in a strepo, but those helicopters can't drop the supplies right in the base. Because if they're constantly flying right over the base and dropping supplies right there, that makes it easier for someone to shoot at them. Mm. So they have to drop them in different spots each time around the, the outpost. And then the soldiers have to go and get the supplies and hoof them back and carry them up the mountain. And so when they finally get the generator, you see that they attach these ropes to the generator, and then they've got to drag the generator up the mountain on a sled back to the outpost. You know, and, and one of the soldiers that's coming in, he's he as soon as he gets inside the razor wire, he drops down and sets down his pack, you know, because it turns out he's carrying this ridiculously heavy pack because he's bringing creature comforts. Like he brought, I think he said, six different flavors of cigarettes. Mm. But those are the things that are going to endear him to the people that he's there with. And, you know, so it was difficult to resupply. They had to fly in their food, their their water, all of that type of stuff. And, yeah, I mean, it's an outpost. It's it's not well stocked. It doesn't have regular access to things. So, yeah, like I said, I would rate this 3 and 7 as well. I think Restrepo is a little bit better. Mm. And previously these movies were rated much higher. Right. I think that after the way that the war ended, the ratings have started to trend down on these. I'm okay. curious to see how they'll be viewed in maybe another decade from now. So, yeah. Now, Nate, how do you rank the four movies we watched this okay. month? So the movies we watched this month were Paths of Glory from 1957 about First World War, The Enemy Below from the mid to late 50s about World War II, Full Metal Jacket from 87 about Vietnam, and then Cornegal 2014 about the war in Afghanistan. Do you want me to start? I, I'm willing to go first. I actually would rank Full Metal Jacket first. Okay. I think I'd put Passive Glory second. Mm-hmm. And then I would actually, I think this is where we're probably going to differ. I would put The Enemy Below third and Korngal fourth. You are correct. That's where we differ. Uh, I'm with you on Pat, uh, uh, Full Metal Jacket and Paths of Glory, but I would put Korngal uh, above The Enemy Below. Not by a huge amount, uh, but chiefly because Korngal gave me something new. Whereas uh, the enemy below was a lesser retread of, of other things I'd seen. Yeah, I agree that they're very close. For me, like I said, Restrepo was more effective than Korngal. It was interesting to revisit this unit a second time. I'm glad he made a second de- documentary about mm-hmm. them, but it just wasn't, you know, yeah. And plus, I like, I did like the enemy below. So mm-hmm. why you didn't? So. Oh. Yep. Well, I'm Rob. 
And I'm Nate. And this is Rob and Nate Record a Podcast. Hey, Rob. Yeah? Who would win in a fight, George Clooney or Fabio? <laughs> oh my gosh, I forgot about that. <laughs> Apparently these guys had a six-hour debate. About who would win. In this outpost. George yeah. Clooney or Fabio. Well, and I think that they were right. I think George Clooney probably would win. I, you know, me too. Yeah. And I, I, I thought about it. He's a little bit scrappier. So, and I'm also, I was like, we're not talking about them at their prime. It's like, I'm not. I'm assuming this is the George Clooney and Fabio that would have existed circa 2009. Yeah. Uh, George Clooney's got to be about a decade younger than Fabio, I would think. And while Fabio has the obvious advantage of the upper body strength and the mass, George Clooney would outsmart him. You know what I'm largely basing it on? All right. Fabio's reaction to getting hit by the bird on that roller coaster. Okay. Do you remember that? I don't know if I, I don't know if I know that. I, it's got to be a YouTube. I video, think right? it was here in California, in the U.S. Mm. I think he was in California, and if I'm not mistaken, the ride was called Superman, and it's the one where they accelerate really quickly down a track, and then the, the mm. cars immediately go vertical. And when they were accelerating down the track, a bird flew by, and he got hit in the face by the bird, and it like broke his nose. And, you know, which, you know, when you make your money off of your face and your body, you know, having no. a broken nose is, is unfortunate, but he didn't seem to handle his injury very well. well. He was hit by bird flu very unexpectedly. Wow. Are you going to make a monkey pox joke next? I suppose I could. <laughs> Fun. You got an advertisement? Brought to you by... I think that was Dasani water. They were mostly drinking. Yeah. Yeah. By Dasani. There you go. Choice of Restapo. Oh, Pierre Restapo. Yeah.